fronts on state legislators. He has served in both houses of his state legislature and holds both undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Denver. He and his wife Marjorie are reside in Denver. They have three sons and one granddaughter. And I hope you'll give a tremendously warm welcome to a great guy, Mr. Herrick Roth, president of the Colorado State AFL-CIO. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, uh, Brother Cliff Schrader. You know, when somebody introduces someone, the problem is that you don't know whether you're clapping for the person about to speak or the one who just spoke, but I've had a warm spot in my heart for Cliff Schrader ever since the day that I first met him, uh, struggling as he must in the leadership of having workers in this state, let alone people in this state, understand what organized labor is all about. And uh, why don't you just give a special hand to Cliff Schrader before I begin? Uh, ben Radcliffe and uh, Adam Seidel, whom I just met for the first time just now. I've known Ben for some time. And uh, Lee Swenson, whom I enjoyed hearing because, uh, for one thing, I noticed that uh, his hair is a little longer than some of us in my generation. I like that, if you want to know the truth of it. And I'm glad that uh, to see him on your program and on your podium and part of your membership and part of your office officership of the South Dakota Farmers Union and many other friends, including my friend Ed Smith over here, whom I happen to know from North Dakota times, and he's had me up there, and I understand is now Vice President of the National Farmers Union. I want to just uh, comment on a few things. Uh, I don't want to be nostalgic, and I want to try, in just a short time here, not to overdo the welcome or the hospitality or even the, the chance I had to accept this invitation. I, I really consider South Dakota one of the great states, even though I haven't lived in it since 1933. I uh, even think more and more of it these days, more fondly, I guess, than I did when I, was a, when I was a youngster growing up over in that part of the country known as Fall River County. Uh, I notice you have some Farmers Union members in Fall River County. I notice you have some in Custer County. My mother grew up in Buffalo Gap, a town that nobody ever heard of, but they put out a tremendous book here uh, the other, uh, just in the last couple of years. If any of you live in that part of the country, it's only got about 1,000 pages in it, and it's got some farm families who are members of the Farmers Union contributing to it on our yesteryears. And when a little town of 155 people puts out a volume that's sizable and uh, understands its own heritage and its future, I think I have to feel pretty kindly about it. But I also was always kind of e interested in the H's, not because I grew up in Hot Springs, but as a kid in school, I used to... Uh, be able to rattle off all the all the station stops on the CNNW and the and the Milwaukee across the state. I never got over here in the East River country very often, so I at least learned what the towns were. And I had to drive in from Pier this morning because it's the only air flight I could get here in time and still get back to Denver for a meeting tonight to drive on down to Sioux Falls. So I uh, just came through the towns, you know, that I, I used to know at least by name. Some of them really aren't towns anymore, perhaps, but. Uh, when you, when you come through uh, uh, places like Harold and Hollabird and Highmore and you understand you got some H's and counties uh, like uh, Hughes and Hyde and Hand, and then I come into town and I see the Humphrey Drugstore sign, you know, and I know HHH in that capacity too. I know I'm in friendly home country and it's, it's ni nice to be here. There are a lot, of, a lot of things I really want to say today and I can't say them all. Uh, several of you have already stopped me and said, oh yes, we see you on TV every Sunday. In fact, one person let me know that he saw our last Sunday's program and if you saw that one yesterday, I guess you understand a little bit about some of the, some of the kinds of people that we have in the trade union halls in this country. Because the people are the count are the people who are in the trade union halls. And uh, the people that sometimes don't count and don't count just right or uh, get too high up in society and uh, for, for forget about the fact uh, the people that they're trying to represent. And I think in Colorado here, uh, we at least have, uh, have made a stand and our stand was just to go right ahead and go directly to the point. We went ahead and endorsed the McGovern Shriver ticket on August 7th and then we were told to rescind or take disciplinary action. I'm not going to go through all of that with you except to say that on August 30th we had a hearing. A federal court judge just noted that that hearing seemed to be very robust. He read the transcript. He says, I, I, can, I can observe very plainly why the witnesses on the stand have said that it was not a hearing. He says, it's very true, it certainly was not a hearing. He says, it's like Alice in Wonderland, you know, I shall be the judge and the jury. 
And then, of course, you eventually go out and cut off your head, and you execute. And uh, the judge, the jury, and everybody came to, came to Denver on August 30, and they wrote a report. And then we were ordered to put under, be put under trusteeship, and so we decided the law of the land certainly ought to be good enough to interpret the, even the AFL-CIO Constitution, which incidentally is a good constitution. So we went into court, and that, uh, that constitution, from our point of view, was properly interpreted. And last Monday afternoon, at least to the, uh, to the good feelings of the trade unionists of the state of Colorado, and I hope all across the countryside, even though we'll have to continue to battle appeals all the way up, and even though, as Cliff Schrader and I know, the status of the AFL-CIO in Colorado really won't be known until November, but not November 1972, November 1973, at a convention of the AFL-CIO, probably again down in non-union Miami. Uh, and at that time, we'll find out whether our fate was sealed or saved on the date of last Monday by the federal court. But in the meantime, we're very much in business, and we have some lively trade unionists, and uh, I'm happy to report that I could come. When Ben called me, I said to Ben, well, I'm, uh, if we're not out of business, if we're not out of commission, in which case you can decide whether you still want me to come up, and Cliff Schrader can still decide whether you want me to come to Huron, why, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. But I did, uh, I am glad that I'm here today, and I'm very much official, and I'm very much AFL-CIO, and I'm very much in an elected position that I was elected to. And so I'll speak with as much authority as it seems to me I'm now entitled to speak. I want to also mention while I'm at it a man that I wish were still here today. I haven't seen him in about a year, and I want to see him. He's been sending some tremendously fine and encouraging letters to us from Pennsylvania. You heard him last night. He is a Coloradoan. <clears throat> he uh, had a lot to do with the lifeblood of this organization of yours, not just in South Dakota, but all over this nation for the farm families. He's a guy who understands what collective bargaining is all about, and I suppose one of the great grievances that he probably still has to this time is that the laws of our land do not define the way farm families can really bargain for their rights. And it's a cinch that we wouldn't have to apologize along the line, any place, any place, for what the price of the final product is in the supermarket, whether it's operated by union clerks or not. We wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't have to holler about that price if we really knew that the people who are at the basic production end in our society were, one, still family farmers, and two, had bargained for their own price and bargained for it right. It doesn't take deals, and I'm not here to give a big political speech today, but it doesn't take deals to sell wheat through certain kind of subsidized special capital interests in this country and then let you here who are the wheat farmers in this state and in eastern Colorado and in North Dakota and all the great wheat states of the country. There's no sense of our kidding ourselves that there was any bargaining in terms of that price. There was a bargain, all right, but it was a closed-door bargain. It was a behind-the-scenes bargain, and it was a bargain aimed at making profits, not for the people who were on the land that produced the wheat. And I really always feel good about the fact that uh, that really, just like you say, let's keep the, land, keep the land in the hands of the people, we better keep it there, and we better keep the government in the hands of the people, and we better keep our trade unions in the hand of the people, and someday maybe we'll get business in the hands of the people and not those who are just profiteers in our society. But a guy who knows that, <clears throat> a guy who knows that and who's known it all of his life and is just as young as the young men and women who are right here today among you, is a guy named Jim Patton, and I was listening to him on the radio on the way across the state just now, and it was just a pleasure to hear his voice again. His voice sounds just as vigorous as usual, and nobody has to tell me about his commitment because he's been one of the great guys, and I hope nobody ever loses the spirit of a Jim Patton because if so, the people are going to lose the land. They, we've lost too much of it already. We've lost too much of it really in terms of the deals that go on in business in this country. Well, I want to... Uh, commend the union people in this state for having sent with you to more good votes for the trade unionists and for the workers and for the farmers of this country than the state of Colorado has produced in the last 12 years, and you've done it through your two U.S. congressmen in the last year, last two years, and you've done it certainly through Senator George McGovern over the years. And the nice part about it is, is that somehow or other you've done it in this state. I, re I remember that my county, by consent of the Republican Party in Fall River County, always had a Democratic clerk of the courts. And uh, this was arranged. No Republican ever ran against him. If anybody ran against him, it didn't make any difference who the person was. He might be just close to fraudulent. He would have been elected. 
and that was the nature of the county. Maybe it still is the nature of the county. And I understand by reading the records that uh, certain states in this country are still highly Republican. Well, at least you haven't shown it in your governor's chair and your lieutenant governor's chair, and you haven't shown it in the Congress of the United States, and you've contributed more, really, to the welfare of Chicago and New York than many of the states of this country. And I have no doubt about the fact that it's the direct and indirect coalition of the labor movement in this state with the farm families who are the great bulk of the voting population directly and indirectly in this state that have done this. And so you have made a basic contribution to the people of this land. It isn't just the idea of keeping the land in the hands of the people. The important thing is really to keep that government there. You know, we have a lot of blue-collar blues, though, these days. We really do. And there have been a lot of articles written using this kind of alliterative language. And the blue-collar people, whether they work on farms or whether they work between farms and small towns or businesses or whether they work in the cooperatives or whether they work in, in business and industry, the blue-collar people still are basic to the production of this nation. And I suppose we'll always have to have them. And I'm not a bit unhappy about it. It isn't the white-collar people in Colorado who elected me a white-collar person in terms of how I got into the union movement, at least to the presidency of our state AFL-CIO. There are some of them at the moment who are faltering a little bit under orders from above. This is a good way, as Cliff knows, this is a good way of finding out when we separate the men really from the youngsters. <clears throat> I don't want to use the word boys anymore because that's a derisive term, but at least we separate the men from the youngsters at a point. And I know that it isn't a matter whether you are in a blue collar job or a white collar job or where you are these days. But if there is no purchasing power in the society, if there is no strength in the union halls, if people don't understand that they can belong to the trade union movement in this country, I don't have to tell you. Even if you bargain for the price, you might just be selling it to a nation that's poor, and if this nation is poor, the world is poor, and if so, even all of us, except for what we're going to produce like we did in the Dust Bowl days when even our family, you know, borrowed a chicken and borrowed an egg in the late 20s and the early 30s for the townspeople, from the country people so we could keep alive. But that wasn't a society that any of us liked, as good as it was to rub your hands in the soil, whether it was drought-stricken or not. What we have to understand is that we do have a relationship, and there are too many people who are trying to point out our differences to us and not our similarities. And this really does concern me. I, I love driving across farm country. I, I just kind of feel it again, even in the days when a guy who became a forerunner of the most anti-labor act that this nation has ever had, the Taft-Hartley Act. It was really written by a neighbor of mine in Hot Springs who later moved to Custer, a guy named Case. He's got a bridge name for him now in Washington, D.C. But I rode across the state with him on two occasions as a high school kid, once to an extemporaneous speaking contest uh, that the now ailing Carl Munt judged, and he didn't like what I said about Gandhi as a knee-pants knee uh, 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 knee, knee kind of guy standing down here as a sophomore in high school at the University in Vermilion making a speech saying, I thought Gandhi looked pretty good. And he didn't like my attitude about Gandhi. He didn't rate me very well. There were some better speakers there. He had a right to do it, you understand. But I used to shoot pheasant coming across the state with a guy named Francis Case, you know, and I, I liked the country. I fondly remember him because on a person-to-person -person basis, he was a decent guy. When I later, you know, grew up and found out about the economic affairs of the world and that he came from South Dakota to protect the great interests of the country and not the people of the countryside, I had, I had, had to at least question his politics. Well, now at least you've got a George McGovern and you've got a Jim Aberesk and you've got other people, you know, that are going to do great things for us in the Congress. But as I think about this, I think that they also protect the blue color and the white color and the professional people. And it's interesting. It's interesting that the white color people who are not organized in this country because of amendments to the Taft-Hartley Act, because of the compulsory open shop in states like South Dakota, and there's no sense of kidding ourselves about it, it's bad for people, even if you think the price of labor is too high. The price of labor isn't too high if your goods were properly placed. But you see, the white-collar person in this country taking all of the best jobs in the country and putting them together, all the present administration can now tell us is they average $95 a week in gross income if they have a job, 95 bucks a week. Well, you think of your own pocketbook if you want to for a moment. That's the average on the white-collar guy, and less than one out of 20 belongs to a union. They're in service trades, they're in offices, they're in medical centers, they're in banks. They're in the business offices of the great corporations of our land. 
They look forward to that retirement watch someday and hope that Social Security is high enough to take care of them because probably the company isn't going to. Well, just above them are the less skilled and the unorganized blue-collar people. They get all of $14 a week more. And even the highly skilled people from great trades like the plumbers and fitters, like Cliff Schrader's union, are only averaging 43 bucks a week higher. And all that the people who work for a living and draw a wage, all that the people have to show is for their capital investment, their labor. And yet there isn't anybody in this great wealthy country of ours, even though the per capita average income against the top 5% of the country now averages over $100,000 adjusted gross per family per year. The average of even the highest skilled in the trades across this nation, in the blue collar trades, the best paid of all American workers, is slightly less than $700 a month. Well, it's one of the reasons you know that uh, we don't necessarily value what comes from your farms, from our farms, from our land, from the people. So what the farmer's world is all about is what the laborer's world is all about. And anybody who has any dignity about him appreciates both because your capital is not only your land, your capital is your own labor. But we have a lot of bridge crossing we have to do of our own. And I don't want to take too long in uh, extending my remarks except to say that I'm going to leave with Ben copies of things that I think are pertinent to our relationship. For one thing, I think you might as well read the court order that we were handed in Denver, Colorado, which says that there is democracy promised in the AFL-CIO and the Colorado Labor Council did nothing more than try to protect it. This was a conservative Republican judge appointed by the Nixon administration who nonetheless followed the law on the, of our land as he sat in the court's bench. We were told by our liberal Democratic attorneys, don't go to court, Herrick, you're going to get murdered because you've endorsed George McGovern. And we went to court and we got a just decision out of the courts of the land. And it's a good thing that courts still can give just decisions. Well, I think, Ben, you and your people here will like certain parts about this because it even quotes what the AFL-CIO Constitution's all about. And then I heard Cliff speak about Proposition E, and I was just talking to Ben about it here as Cliff was speaking, and I said, uh, I think I know what it is, but tell me quickly. And he says, well, you know, only the legislature has been able to refer changes in our Constitution. Then I remembered back to a convention where Cliff had me and Mitchell just a few months back. And I remember this proposition, and you had best passed that proposition. I'll tell you why. The only good changes we've had in the Constitution of the state of Colorado since 1876 were all initiated by the people. We have not had a single constructive change made in our Constitution referred by the legislature. All they ever do is do technical changes because legislators, as much as we respect representative government, primarily are in somebody else's pocket and I don't mean to demean anybody who sits in Pierre or Denver, Colorado or Albany, New York, but I served six years and six knowledgeable years in the legislative body and I watch too many in the modern language, too many of my colleagues flake off when the going got tough because the dollars were someplace else and therefore their votes were dictated to by dollars and not by this. We've got four initiatives on our ballot in Colorado this year. And Ben, I want you to look at these. Not that we're gonna get these passed, We've got a $180,000 campaign being waged by the insurance industry against one of them. We're going to get $5,000 together to answer them on no-fault auto insurance, which will be the best law in the country if we can pass it. They're trying to tell us it's not as good as Massachusetts law, which has already reduced premiums 42% in three years. You just smoke that one even in terms of farm vehicles if you want to in your own pipes, in your own farmland, and determine what that is and what you're now paying. And then we've got another one on here on tax reform, and Cliff mentioned tax reform, and I heard Ben's report mentioning tax reform to you. Don't kid yourself that property taxes are fair, even if you think they're fair. Don't let anybody talk you into the fact that you need a base for your school district, which is in your property, whether it's your cattle or your sheep or your farmland or whatever you produce on it, whatever they say the value is. There is nothing equitable about it. All you got to do is take two sections of land side by side in any county of, of this state in terms of their productive wealth, and you find out if you and your neighbor are assessed exactly the same if all other things are equal about your property. You take it and find it out, and then you'll find out that no county assessor can ever do it for you. It is an inequitable base to begin with. The only base of taxation that's any good is a $1 bill. It may fluctuate in value, but it means the same on a precise day to anybody, and you can either tax it when you spend it, which becomes regressive if the rate gets too high, a sales tax, an excise tax, or else you can tax it when you get it. And then you can put the rates where they belong. 
Don't tell me there's no money in the state of South Dakota. I imagine in proportion to Colorado it's alike. We've unveiled the fact the other day, an unbelievable fact, that 50,000 people in Colorado filed returns last year on Colorado State net incomes of $31,000, but the two people who were in the millionaire class didn't even report $10,000 of net income, and the average of those who did file had adjusted gross family income in excess of $100,000. And there were only one million taxpayers, that means we had the nation's average, and you've got the nation's average. And my guess is the people who are getting the big money from land, from real estate, in the professions, the doctors, the lawyers, the merchants, the chiefs, the business people of this state are in no different position than we are in the state of Colorado. Well, we're initiating a law and the Colorado Association of Commerce and Industry here is saying they're going to fight it on five technical things. It's ridiculous. They're going to try to avoid the issue. They're going to spend a quarter of a million dollars to defeat this one. We got 8,000 bucks to answer them. That's all we've got, except to put a graduated income tax in. And it would say to the people at the top, next year you're going to pay us $150 million in income tax in the state of Colorado instead of $41 million. And it would say to the people at the bottom, you're going to pay us about $5 a piece less than you did last year. And we're going to abolish school property taxes in the process. No more taxes on property for schools. Now, I don't know that we'll pass it. <clears throat> but it's an initiative. And the initiators are the chairman of Colorado Project Common Cause, myself as a citizen, as president of the state AFL-CIO, and even though some of his people have backed away from him in their ignorance about what in the devil this is all about, which means the communication has not gone out to the farm families in Colorado, John Stencil, president of the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. We three citizens have initiated this. We could pass it. If we do, it'll be the most constructive tax reform in the nation. And this is one of the reasons we are fighting for our life to stay in business in spite of the president of the AFL-CIO. Now, <clears throat> Ben told me 30 minutes. Okay, I'm getting within 10 minutes of that time. I've got to, I've got to make progress here, and I'm, all I'm doing so far is talking to you. Well, I guess that's what I'm really here for. I'm going to quote a little bit from a speech I gave to our own state AFL-CIO convention last Thursday morning when we were confronted with whether or not we were going to continue our endorsement of Mr. McGovern having the court decision on our side. You know, it sounds easy. It isn't that easy. People are people. They have ideas. But one of the things I said I want to repeat for you here because I think it is rather basic. Basic among the questions before you is the issue of corruption of power, the inhumanity of bigness. If people are going to control the land, remember it can't get big control. Bigness in itself is not bad if it is in control by the people by whom and for whom it has been created and sanctioned. We in American labor, as in American business, as in American agriculture, as in American government, must find the way of people involvement, either by new forms or by the vitalization of our existing organizational structures. I guess that's what you're all about here in the South Dakota Farmers Union. And you've been, in, been about it for 57 years. You've got to continually revitalize. What we proclaim here to ourselves is not just our utter disrespect for bureaucracy and labor or business or agriculture or government. That permits the handing down of unilateral orders from a single officer or office to command people to do the bidding of the order. The involvement, the determination of the people themselves must be the rule of the day. And the officer and office should serve the decision of the people that people cannot have served upon them the order of an officer and officer. Power that emanates from the program and the vote of the people who are to be affected by the administration of that power, be affected by the administration of that power, does not in itself corrupt until the administrator abuses the power. And I'm going to speak about that in my last seven or eight minutes here. But listen to this. People who by apathy, by indifference, or by fear refuse to end the abuse, even while they recognize it for what it is, then they delay the day of just decision. I saw all these windbreaks across here as I came along. <clears throat> I don't have to tell you that the farm families in South Dakota weren't that smart in late 1920s or 1930s. I don't have to tell you that we did a lot of crazy things in the early 30s after Mr. Roosevelt became president. I don't have to tell you this state didn't the first time vote for him. But I do have to tell you that people did find out they could rescue even in times of drought a certain amount of the productive value and wealth of farmland. Well, that eventually came because the people, instead of letting there be an, an abuse of corruption of power in our government, finally turned it around, at least for a while. There happens to be a great guy in Denver, Colorado, who is a former publisher of one of the few independent newspapers left in this country. The attempt at the moment is to control it. It's the Denver Post. 
It isn't the best newspaper, and we fight with it all the time, but at least it's independent and made independent political judgments. A guy named E. Palmer Hoyt was the editor and publisher. He managed to maintain the independence of that paper for the last 25 years, even while creeping bigness is now coming in to take over its stockholders and really to put it in probably one of the most conservative postures of any newspaper in the country. But Palmer Hoyt called us the other day, and he says, my God, guy, do you know what you're doing? And I thought he was going to give me hell. He's retired now. In his retirement contract, he gets an office and a secretary from the Denver Post, but no policy control. He says, you're taking on the big guys. But he says, and the big guys are wrong. They're supposed to be taken on. He says, if you don't know it, you're setting a classic, a classic example for the people in the trade union halls. I said, well, thank you, Paul. Yep, I didn't really know what you're going to say to me, but thank you very much. He said this <clears throat> in a speech on August 14, he sent it to Sarge Schreiber, and when Schreiber came to town the other night, he hadn't read it yet. So I handed it to him and told him to read it on the way out to a political rally that Ep Hoyt was back there in the hotel where we were, and when he came back, he better sit down and talk to Mr. Hoyt. And incidentally, he read enough of it to put some of his speech that same night, last Wednesday night. This is what Hoyt says. There are several very dangerous and seriously unregulated monopolies. One that I want to talk about is the newspaper field, where the chains are getting bigger. The Gannett chain now numbers 54. It was 30 20 years ago. Newhouse has 22. He had two. The Lee papers have several score. I believe Lord Thompson and Alien has now 52 papers completely under his ownership in the United States. Because as newspapers are combined into big chains, they become more a part of big business and big government, and they get along very well with big business, which has a tendency to want to keep big government, present big government, in power. With the electronic press under the government's thumb, it'll be a sorry day for our country if the printed press gets itself in the same position. And speaking of monopolies, the worst monopoly of all is the monopoly entirely unregulated of conglomerates, both international and national, because it leads to the monopoly of money. I wrote in a letter to Hubert Humphrey during his primary campaign, and he, in a Philadelphia speech shortly thereafter, even though his campaign was not successful, returned to the referred to this country as, properly, a country of money, by the money, and for the money. And then he went into, he says, the first piece of legislation that Adolf Hitler put through in the Reichstag, following the election by the people, which he underscored, was to refuse incorporation papers from that point on of any concern of less than $200,000. That's in our money. That'd be worth $2 million today in this country. And to seek to disenfranchise any firm that then existed with only $40,000 and less in assets and capital. In other words, big government likes to deal with big business. As I've said before, if the McGovern group can keep the young voters and getting out that young group, I think they've got an excellent chance to win. It isn't only the youth that's unhappy about the situation of the monopolies, but the older people of, of, as well. I praise youth, and I say so to this audience. And he was speaking to an audience that was 65 years of age, average. He had them right down their age, and he took them out and had, a, had his secretary put them on a, on a business uh, tape for 300 people, and they turned out to be 65. So he says it's a good thing <clears throat> that there is a generation gap, particularly since it's a moral gap, and that the younger generation now seek different goals, different patterns of government. They're fed up with us as the establishment. I said it's high time that the younger generations come along and give the older generation a real kick in the pants. This audience, of course, he writes to Shriver then, didn't particularly like what I said until I started mentioning things that youth wanted to know. For instance, how can we send a man to the moon and bring him back in a split-second basis via computers? But somehow that we just can't make pollution-free automobile engines. Well, I'm not going to read you the rest of this, except to say that 3% of the people in this country <clears throat> happen to own 40% of all the wealth of this country and happen to own 80% of all the movement of money of this country in five banks. And those banks affect banks in this state because you've had branch banking. Banking, We have it under guise in Colorado. We don't have it. Well, now I'm about to get to the end of my remarks, which I'm sure will please you no end. But <clears throat> I conclude with this. The minister who came to invoke our convention last Thursday when we were facing the crisis in Colorado <laughs> in the labor movement happened to sense what we were all about. <clears throat> And in praying to the Lord, he said that he, we recognize this as a new day, one which gives us a chance to evaluate yesterday, one which gives us a fresh start and a chance to live in today, and a, plan to, a time to plan for tomorrow. Now, these are challenges. We consider them the challenges of the day. 
We ask that you'll free us from the illusion of insignificance. You know, that sign means nothing over there if you, if you really think you're insignificant. It means nothing. You're going to lose your land anyway. We're going to lose our land. The people are going to lose their rights if we consider ourselves insignificant. The illusion that my efforts as an individual, that our efforts as one group, in this case the South Dakota Farmers Union, are futile, ineffective, meaningless in the face of a vastly structured society in the world. This is the challenge we have to overcome so that we'll all toss out, whether it's the South Dakota AFL-CIO, the South Dakota State Federation of Labor AFL-CIO, or the South Dakota Farmers Union, We've all got to toss out the feelings of insignificance and grab under the role in life that we have, a role that does count, not only for our own life, but for the lives of many others. Now, words as words are meaningless. If people who use them mean what they say, they have value. The problem is that the person who is speaking or writing the words may know what he means, but his listeners or his readers, if any, may not be listening or reading. I don't know how much of what I've said has really come across. You can just tell I feel strongly about it. Therefore, in time of campaign rhetoric, the master deceivers can play upon words, and words are their games, and games are to play. And the tragedy is that too many of us really like games. I'd like to hope that between now and November 7th, 1972, we can stop playing games in the political arena. I'd like to hope that when we speak to each other, we understand each other. I would like to hope that we could see each other as we really are that candidates in high places would understand that they are not one bit different than any of us here, except that we have, they have a greater responsibility than anyone else in America to be different only in one respect. Those who either seek to be re-elected to office or to be first elected to office must seek to represent us and understand that in public office they must tip the scales of their own human behavior against their normal frailties against the frailties that some of us privately are not quite as cautious about in our personal lives. What I'm saying here is that Richard Nixon is a human being, that George McGovern is a human being, that each of us is a human being, but in the high offices of our nation we had not best play with words or play games in 1972. And it seems to me that Richard Nixon is playing games with words, that he is adept at playing games with words, that he has played his games so well that he leaves confusion in this land that he is one day anti-communist and the next day pro-communist, that one day he is anti-worker and the next day pro-worker, that he is anti-farmer one day and pro-farmer the next, that he's anti-business on one day but not very often and pro-business usually, that he is anti-partisan and pro-partisan, that he is anti-internationalist and pro-internationalist, that he's anti-inflationist and pro-inflationist. In spite of what he tells you, the House... The house